The power of community. The power of community. It is a pleasure to welcome you to Dominican University of California. My name is Denise Lucy. I am a professor here and the director of the Institute for Leadership Studies and a partner with Book Passage for this evening's event. I wanted to thank Bill and Elaine Petricelli for helping make this a reality. Thank you so much. Elizabeth Edwards, what a wonderful opportunity to have a chance to hear her ideas, her stories about community. It's perfectly fitting since our Institute for Leadership Studies is really about how we can help people become better leaders. And its focus is how we can build our businesses, our organizations, to be socially responsible. We have many projects in the community. This is one of them, our leadership lecture series. So we envision a world in which leaders are civically engaged and ethical and facilitate positive social and organizational change and committed to social responsibility. So if you know Nothing more than our lecture series, please do give us a call because we have many projects. Go to our website. I would like to introduce our introducer for the evening, Dr. Susan Adams. She is an alumna of Dominican in that she is, was a professor here of nursing, so it's my honor to have her back tonight. Susan is the president of the County of Marin Board of Supervisors. I'd like to introduce the Honorable Supervisor, Susan Adams. Good evening, everybody. Um, I was so honored and privileged to be able to have a few moments um, with Elizabeth Edwards uh, before entering here, and I am looking forward uh, to introducing you and reading a little bit about her um, very interesting life. She is the daughter of a decorated Navy pilot, and in her early years, she attended school in Japan. She traveled around the world. Her father was stationed in Japan with a recon reconnaissance squadron, flying missions over China and North Korea, and also he participated in the Vietnam War. As an undergraduate at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Elizabeth majored in English. She went on to study American literature and then switched to law, graduating from the UNC Law School in May of 77. She met John in law school, and they married the Saturday after they took their exam. They were very busy. <laughs> then John and Elizabeth had four children including their eldest daughter, Catherine, who is attending law school, so the acorn didn't drop far from that tree, and their eight-year-old, Emma Claire, and their six-year-old son, Jack. Their first child, Wade, died tragically in 1996. Like her husband, Elizabeth has an impressive legal background. Following law school, she clerked with the U.S. District Court Judge Calvin Clark, Jr. in Norfolk, Virginia. Later, she worked for the North Carolina Attorney General's Office and then was a bankruptcy lawyer in Raleigh, North Carolina. She also taught legal writing as an adjunct instructor at UNC Law School for two years. And in 97 to 98, she was a member of the first group of public fellows at the College of Arts and Sciences at UNC. In 1996, John and Elizabeth helped establish the Wade Edwards Foundation, and they helped build a free computer lab, the Wade Edwards Learning Lab for high school students in Raleigh. Recently, the foundation opened a similar computer lab in Goldsboro. Elizabeth volunteered at the lab in Raleigh nearly every day until the family came to Washington following her husband's 1998 election to the U.S. Senate. 
The Wade Edwards Foundation also runs a statewide short fiction contest for the North Carolina's high school juniors, awarding scholarships and grants to high school English students. Both Elizabeth and her husband are strongly committed to strengthening communities, a theme throughout her book, and expanding educational opportunities for all children. She volunteered with the Parent Teachers Association at her children's schools. She's been active in youth soccer leagues and in several roles as mother. Elizabeth Edwards shares her husband's deep commitment to improving the daily lives of Americans and making sure that everyone in this country has the opportunity to succeed a passionate advocate for children and families, as well as an accomplished attorney, she has been a tireless advocate for many important causes. The American people got to know Elizabeth personally when she campaigned extensively across the country during her husband's presidential and vice presidential campaigns, and then the day after the general election in 2004, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. Her doctors believe her treatment went well and the prognosis continues to be very positive and at every step she has proven that she's a fighter and that she will beat breast cancer. I've had the opportunity to read some of her story in her book, which left me with the same feeling that I have when I swap stories with a good friend over a cup of coffee. I have a father with a military background and a brother who is currently serving in the Air Force as a Chief Master Sergeant, and I could identify with many of the issues she raised that she related about military families. I also think it no small coincidence that Elizabeth Edwards is here tonight as a breast cancer survivor and speaking to us in Marin, a county which is experiencing among the highest rates of breast cancer in this country. So with no further ado, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce to you Elizabeth Edwards. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Susan. It was, that was lovely, and uh, now nobody needs to read the book. Um, uh, and uh, Dr. Lucy and Dominican University, it's a, a real treat for me to be here, so thank you very much for that. I want to know if anybody in this room thought they would ever read a book written by a bankruptcy lawyer. Uh, I have had a really interesting life. I've had a lot of experiences in a lot of different places. And during that time, I listened. Uh, and when I listened, I learned things. And uh, I hope that when I found something to be a wise statement that somebody made or a wise way that they chose to live their life, I tried to adapt it for my own life. Uh, and it's made my life better to do that. Everything that you, that you hear from me or read in this book that's wise undoubtedly came from someone else wiser than I. Uh, and everything that's nonsense is entirely my own. <laughs> I wrote this book after 2004 uh, because first someone came to me and asked if I'd write a book. And I think what they wanted was a memoir because they knew uh, some of the things we'd been through and thought that maybe somebody might buy the book. And I thought, honestly, I don't want to write a me, me, me memoir. Um, but I had a lot of time after 2004 sitting in hospital rooms uh, and uh, or being uh, very tired and lying in bed and thought then about whether I had something to say in a book. And I thought actually that I did. And uh, I was reminded of it when I had the breast cancer because so many people wrote me uh, emails, letters, cards, all sorts of things, most of them cheering me on, all of them cheering me on, but very, uh, quite a number saying, you're so strong, you can, I know you can do this. You're stronger than I am. I couldn't handle it, but you can. It's the same thing I heard in the campaign uh, for people who knew that we had lost a son. I couldn't campaign. Uh, if, if I'd been through it, you've been through it. You are, you're, you're so strong, you can do this. And I realized that people were, thought I was something that I wasn't. You know, maybe the people that they read about in the newspaper, they're superheroes. They can, you know, they can handle anything. Um, the truth of the matter is, every one of us, whether we're in the newspapers or not, are humans, and we are vulnerable to pain uh, to disappointment and to tragedy, and I thought it was important to convey a more realistic message about um, a, a permission slip, in a sense, for people to say, you can, you can be a human. When something knocks you to the ground, it's all right to say, I'm on the ground right now. 
and it's also all right to say to the people around you, I really could use a hand up. And so, you know, you can't tell people what to do, but I can show people that these experiences knocked me out lots of times. Sometimes I'd, you know, I th think I was getting up and they would knock me out again. Um, but in the end, uh, partly because of the people around me, uh, I was able to get up and, and I think in the end, the, the book is, is in some places tough, it is in the end, I, I believe, a hopeful book about what we can do. Now what we can do, of course, is only what we can do because the people around us are supportive. I, I don't think that any of us has the strength to, to manage through the, the death of a child. Uh, very few of us have the strength to manage uh, a fight with, um, uh, with a serious fight with cancer uh, alone. It's only because we have the support systems that we have. So I'm, in addition to being you know, permission slip, it's also a huge thank you note to the people who made my life possible. The way I think about life is um, I think of it as a huge tapestry. You have ribbons of people. The pe important people in your life are huge ribbons of color. They, they brighten your life and actually they form the, you know, sort of the, the structure for your whole tapestry. But then there are all sorts of other people that come into your life. They're, they might be tiny threads, but they're all different and they all come into your life in a way that creates this uh, hope, diverse, colorful, um, uh, magical tapestry. I have that. I have it because I've worked on it. Maybe growing up in the military taught me to reach out to people wherever I was. Uh, certainly my experiences taught me the value of including other people in my life. Uh, and that tapestry created a great, uh, creates a great quality of life for me. So if I'd never had anything bad happen, what I'd have was this fantastic tapestry. But the truth is bad things happen to every one of us. If they haven't happened to you yet, they will because that's what life is. Life is a, is a the series of joys and a series of setbacks. And, uh, and if, if what happens when you hit those setbacks or, the, or those bad moments is that tapestry becomes a warm blanket that covers you. It becomes a safety net into which you can fall. And I found that to be the case. It wasn't just um, my, friend, my family and friends. We all count on them. My neighbors or the people in PTA or on my son's soccer team, though they were there. It was, a, a, my net was so wide and so diverse that I couldn't go any place without having people reach out to me. Um, if I took my daughter to school, the people who worked in the cafeteria would come and hug me. My UPS guy hugs me still whenever I, whenever I see him uh, because it, it, it comes from having reached out to them and then getting back from them when the time comes. I, uh, Gus was my mailman for a long time when we lived in Raleigh. He was a great guy, and his wife had a lot of health problems. I mean, I would listen to Gus talk about his wife's health problems, uh, you know, for more time than he's supposed to spend at one house, I know. <laughs> uh, but what that meant is that when we had bad moments, Gus knew that here's somebody who, who's hurting, who cared about his family. And so my, my tapestry was not just colorful and broad and diverse, but extremely wide. And then I also found a great online community. Uh, I often say about online communities that if you have, um, if you have any uh, condition, uh, real or imagined, there is a support group for you on the internet. <laughs> I know this because I participated in a lot of these groups for a long time before I ever needed them. Uh, participated, uh, I, I know the bankruptcy lawyer thing makes me sound really interesting. Um, I can add to that, I really like to argue about grammar. Uh, so I would, on the internet I would argue about grammar with people. Uh, they have groups of people who all they do is argue about grammar. <laughs> As a matter of fact, they disagree on so many fundamental things they can't even decide what to name their group. <laughs> so there is a, a, a Google group called ALT, a lot of them start ALT. ALT, English Usage, and then there's also ALT Usage English. <laughs> so I knew to go looking for those groups when, when I needed a support group. I knew that there, you know, if there's something, some place to argue about grammar, I bet there's some place to find other grieving people, and I, and I did. Um, 
is finding those people that allowed me to get to the place that I am today, which allowed me uh, to eventually to be the point where I could write this book uh, and spread what I hope are words of hope to people and maybe some ideas about how to get through these things for yourself and to help the people that you care about get through them. One of the ways of getting through them, uh, some of the things, certainly the breast cancer, was humor. Um, it, breast cancer may not sound humorous, but that's only because you haven't gotten a chance to draw your eyebrows on any way you want, uh, uh, which my, I let my children do. You know, I mean, I, we, we, so we, I would have Bozo eyebrows one day and Corella Deville eyebrows another day. Um, but finding the humor, as we all know, finding the humor in something is one of the things, one of the ways that helps us get through it. Uh, I had found the bump in the side of my breast. Um, I wish I could say I found it in a mammogram or a self-exam, but I didn't, and this is my warning to everybody. It's not a good experience for you or your family. It is a very easy thing to do these tests. Uh, and um, I found mine instead taking a shower, and I found a bump that felt like a plum it was so big. Um, I thought, just, I decided at first it must be a cyst. A week later, I had a mammogram. It wasn't a cyst. Uh, the man with the technician's face was my first indication that it was going to be more serious. Uh, it was a tumor, and probably it was cancer. And I scheduled a biopsy five days after that, which was the day after the uh, election in 2004. But. Um, in between, I just sort of held it together because what are you going to do? I'm, I've had the test schedule. There's nothing else to do besides plow through what I believe to be an incredibly important election and try to convince as many people as I could in the remaining days. I wrote this about, um, about those, that, that last day before the election day. I held it together until election day. That morning, November 2nd, 2004, I woke up alone in my hotel room in Des Moines, Iowa. I want to point out that Whenever I mention a state in here, it's undoubtedly a state we lost. So um, in case you wondered how influential I was in that election. I woke up alone in my hotel room in Des Moines, Iowa, and I discovered blood in my urine. Nothing like that had ever happened before, and with that discovery came all the thoughts that I had been pushing aside the four days since seeing the technician's face. I was pretty certain I had cancer. But there was still so much I didn't know, like how long the lump had been there. It could have been years. And what it was doing to me on the inside. Had it metastasized? Did the blood mean it had spread? I hadn't allowed myself to visit that possibility before. But I knew that my chances of survival were much less if the cancer had spread. After finding, uh, making this discovery, I got dressed, went out uh, and to campaign. I campaigned with Christy Vilsack, who's the first lady of of, uh, of Iowa, and we went out into the streets with signs saying, don't forget to vote, it's election day, uh, handing out bagels to people. It was a cold, rainy day in Des Moines. Now, Christy Vilsack, for anybody who's ever seen her, wears a darling little hat all the time. I wasn't wearing a hat. I looked, by the time we'd been out there for a couple of hours, you know, trying to get people to vote, I looked pretty terrible. And of course, then I get back into a car to do the next thing I'm supposed to do. So what do you think I was doing? I was headed to a television studio. <laughs> I was doing remote television for a lot of different places around the country to try to encourage, again, encourage people to vote. In remote television, you sit, you've got a, a plug in your ear, and you talk to a camera in front of you and, uh, and act like you're speaking to whoever's voice is, is in your ear. And you're on TV in Reno or Las Cruces or St. Louis, wherever it is. Uh, you're, uh, you're talking, uh, and it's easy. It's like talking on the telephone, really, except that you can't do this. You know, you can't do this, um, and you have to really pretty much have to sit, pretty, uh, sit still while you're doing it. Uh, and also, because you're on television, you have to look reasonable. Well, my rain-wet hair looked terrible. Typically, I did my own hair and makeup, but today the campaign had found a young local woman to do my hair. You all do not think there are people who can do your hair in Des Moines, do you? <laughs> okay, you're right. <laughs> As she worked, I tried to think of nothing, not of cancer or metastasis or what I would find out the next day at the doctor's office in Boston. I asked her about herself, and as she talked, I watched her small, pretty face. What I didn't watch was what she was doing to my hair. 
By the time I did notice, uh, it was too late. I looked awful. It would have been a darling hairdo, honestly. It would have been a darling hairdo on someone who was sm tiny and pretty, like she was. I am neither tiny nor pretty, and it did not look good on me. Uh, in fact, it was dreadful. So bless this woman's heart, I started to cry. Now, as bad as hair, I, I, everybody's had the experience of bad hair, in the, in the, uh, <laughs> but probably none of you actually cried in the chair. There was little tears at first as I tried to say what was wrong with the style, then sobbing that stopped me from speaking at all. Oh my God. Somebody just said exactly the same thing. She said, oh my God, <laughs> was all she could say. The hairbrush frozen in midair as she looked at me stricken. I tried to respond, but I couldn't speak through the tears. She put the brush down and struggled to speak herself. Mrs. Edwards, she said, tears filling her own eyes. I'm so sorry. You don't like it? <laughs> okay, I'm like in a full cry now. <laughs> I just shook my head and got out of the chair. I walked into the hall where I knew Hargrave. I traveled with a great friend of mine, a teacher who had taken a semester off, Hargrave McElroy. Um, was waiting and uh, she saw what state I was in and she came over and hugged me. Is this not the worst hair you have seen in your entire life? I said to her. Oh, Elizabeth, she said, don't we all love friends like this? She said, it's just a little flat. <laughs> I started to cry harder and sank into Hargrave's arms. This is not about your hair, she said, stating what I already knew. But listen to me, you are going to be fine. The young woman came out into the hall and saw us both crying. <laughs> now at this point, sometimes when I read this, I say, I don't know what this woman is doing today. It may not be hair. <laughs> but I had a reading in Des Moines and she came, which was, it wasn't that great. She came and, uh, and she's still doing hair. <laughs> Then her own tears started as hard as ours. I'm so sorry, she said again, her words breaking apart between the sobs. I can't tell you what it meant for me today, Mrs. Edwards. It was such an honor to be asked to do your hair, and you're probably about to become the wife of the Vice President of the United States. <laughs> and all week I couldn't wait to meet you, and I can't believe how much you hate your hair. <laughs> that just made me feel worse. I I'm not upset, I tried to say, but I was too upset to say it. <laughs> she cried harder, and then I noticed others who were looking at embarrassment with the scene we had created in the hall. So I grabbed the young woman's hand, led her to the bathroom, and locked the door behind us. I'm going to tell you something, I said. I had her hands in mine, I said, but it's a secret. I could have made something up, I could have kept my secret from this total stranger. And I did think about it, but I knew I couldn't be convincing, and so I told this young woman whom I did not know the news that most people in my own family did not know. I have breast cancer, and I'm afraid, because for all I know right now, it could be even worse. I could see both her grief and her relief that she hadn't caused the breakdown. We cried some more and hugged each other. When our eyes finally dried, my face now streaked with fresh mascara, we went back to the chair, and with Hargrave's instructions, she fixed my hair. Ryan Montoya traveled with us, uh, and he came in and asked me if I needed anything. Now, typically, I'd ask for a Diet Coke and sliced green peppers because weight was always an issue for me on the campaign. I was trying to do what I could to watch it, um, but that worry evaporated uh, and had no importance on that day. So I described the mint meringue cookies they had in large tubs at Target. See if you can find those, I asked him. Within an hour, the entire staff and all the makeup people were full on green cookies. Um, so it was, when I look back on my experience of the breast cancer, I look back on a lot of hard times, but I also look back on a lot of great moments of making connections with people, um, with, this, with the hairdresser uh, in Des Moines, with the people who took care of me. Uh, and, I, and, I, and a lot of that makes me smile, and some of it makes me laugh. Uh, and though when I look back at the relationships that I formed after Wade died, uh, I, I have the same sort of satisfaction at, and, and joy at the relationships I have, but of course none of the humor, because there's, there's, there was almost no way to find humor in anything. Uh, and even the, the place where uh, 
you might have expected to find humor was where you sometimes find it because it's so caustic and that's on online communities. But the online communities I, I participated in of, of grieving people um, were actually uh, fairly somber, fairly raw, uh, but they were a great godsend to me. And if you think about it, it makes sense because I, I so love my husband. I so love my daughter, my parents. It was impossible for me in my worst moments to express to them how much I hurt because I know that they hurt too and that they love me and didn't want to see me hurt. So I was like hitting them twice by telling them how much I hurt. So it was much easier actually to turn and tell a stranger how much I hurt, particularly one who really understood. And that's what my online group did. It gave me a chance to be completely honest. In a way, almost I couldn't be even with the people I cared about most, with whom I was closest. Uh, and uh, we treated each other really tenderly. The way the, 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 most of the groups worked is that you would come in, uh, you'd usually read for a little bit so you could figure out how, how this interaction occurred, and then you would introduce yourself and often introduce the person you had lost. Uh, describe them and, and how much they meant to you. Sometimes describe how they died. Sometimes people wouldn't describe how they died. Um, and people would then come give you a hug. Now sometimes it would be, you know, the parentheses hugs from the internet, and sometimes it would be really consoling words. And after you had done that introduction, you then became part of the consoling group. We talk about other things. It wasn't just that, but we t you could talk about anything on the group. You had a bad day. You could go to you could go to the internet and talk. And someplace in the world, there was somebody else sitting there, who ready to give you a hug. Uh, so it was great for me. And our conversations are really candid. I read from one. Um, some people may have heard some of it before, but not all of it. Um, uh, sometimes the exchanges on this group seemed odd when viewed from any distance, but we were all right there, naked and needing each other's warmth. I remember a teacher of mine in graduate school. Dr. Eliason ta taught Old English. One day he talked about the varieties of the English language and about the language of intimacy, the pet names, the peculiar phrasing, the shorthand that we use with our families. And that's how I think of these exchanges, as the kind of family talk for which we give ourselves additional latitude, as when I wrote to Steve, who was so disconsolate over the death of his mother that he could not even summon anticipation for the upcoming birth of his first child. And I wrote, thank you for talking of your mother. My son died in April. I ask God daily to take me instead of taking my boy. And I often think of what he would feel if God granted my wish and Wade lived and I died. He would, I think, be much like you, disoriented and lonely. I speak to you now as I would speak to Wade if he stood in your place. You are my precious son. In the months I had you inside me and the years I had you beside me, I imagined for you every happiness. As you were my firstborn child, I had to learn to be a mother. I learned the names of trees so I could teach them to you. I would finish the books I read to you, even after you fell asleep, with the same cadence and inflection, listening in the pauses to your deep breath. I would hunt for old lullabies to sing to you, picking out the tune on the piano until I made the song my own, your own. And later I stayed up all night typing your papers as you dictated. I searched the stores for a special box for your first corsage. And I bored you with parables so that you would know instinctively the way to be a good man. You never failed me. There was never a point in my parenting you when I would have chosen to hurt you the way you hurt now. And I grieve to think that in death I've caused you this pain that I have made you feel even that the birth of your child will be insufficient joy. I meant to give you life, to give you joy for life. And when I died, knowing I had done all I knew to do, do to give you that joy, I died satisfied. My most important work was done. And now my death undoes that, unwraps my work, and leaves you without the tethers to character and strength and compassion that I worked so hard so lovingly to tie. But son, the best of me did not die. I gave the best of me to you. All I valued and all I cherished, 
all I knew and all I dreamed, I gave to you. It can die, of course, if you let it, or it can live the full and magnificent life I hoped for you. And you can teach that baby all I taught you about living well, and I will live on again. My legacy, my life's work is in your hands. Take hold of life, son. It is all I really hope for in life or in death. Almost nothing else I wrote was as therapeutic for me because I know Wade would, if he could, admonish me as I had admonished Steve. That was the gift of this group, the gift really of every exchange that we have with other people, and that is the receipt of the gift from someone, of kindness, uh, of a hand, is, a, is great, it's terrific. But also reaching out is a present. Um, my reaching out to Steve, I, I, I'll never know, I don't know where he lives, I'll never know how, whether it meant anything to him, but my reaching out meant a great deal to me. Uh, and it's that connection that I try to encourage in people, to try to, to remind us um, that, uh, that that's, what, that's what creates the tapestry. That's what, that's what gives our, our life um, the meaning, honestly. Uh, after the breast cancer, when so many people reached out to me, I had received nearly 100,000 communications, 65,000 emails, nearly, nearly uh, 30,000 communications of other kinds. And what I found uh, in those communications was a need for people to find somebody else. Maybe they'd suffered from breast cancer and it was helpful to them just to reach out to somebody else and hand them a little of their strength. And I knew that my getting that was great for me but I also knew that their giving it from them was also good. So that's what the reason that I included the, the, uh, the letter from Steve was because, precisely because it, no other correspondence really embodies as much as it does the fact that the gift really goes both ways. Thank you all for your patience in listening to me. I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. I think they have a microphone. <laughs> I'm curious, did Steve ever email back after he received that? Um, Steve never emailed back on that, on that thread. Uh, a lot of people, what happens is somebody posts something, and he did, he posted about his mother, and then people would post back uh, a number of things. And it was very often the case that the person who received, who received um, the, the hugs from a large number of people did not respond back to individual ones. He did not respond back to this one that I know of. Honestly, after when John first ran for office, I pulled off uh, off of it, which you can do if you've ever posted on any groups. It used to be called Deja News. Now it's Google Groups. Uh, you can pull your posts off. I, pull, I pulled my posts off and copied them and tried to copy the responsive ones, but I don't have a very I don't have a complete package. So it's my recollection that I didn't receive anything. But it's been a number. You know, this was. It had, I, when I said my son died in April, that means it had to have been in 1996, so it's been 10 years. I don't recollect a response from Steve. You've there spoken go. about the, the positive experience of community. Having been in the political campaign, uh, what might you have learned about the negative aspects of community? I see that one of the, um, one of the future speakers listed uh, from the Clinton administration is, is going to talk about the politics of personal destruction that has yeah. come to characterize much of American political life. Um, so I, I wondered if you had learned anything in your encounters with the media in that particular vein in our current political culture. Well, uh, I did see during the campaign, um, of course, negative things said about uh, about my husband or carries um, uh, negative things uh, said about uh, the children, even negative things said about my four and six year old hard to believe, but yes they 're out there uh, and uh, the one thing I think it didn 't bother me so much honestly. Um, uh, partly because they're people who are just going to be filled with venom and their words can't honestly hurt me. Uh, and maybe that's a gift from Wade's death. 
that words don't bother me so much anymore. Uh, I do, however, despair as I think about that, think about the, the fact that people find that appropriate. I talk in the book about, about um, uh, the comments people made about my weight, uh, you know, and you know, people would sometimes ask me, "What well, do you think that these, you know, what do you think of people who say you're too heavy? And I say, I'm too heavy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> They're right. You know, what do you say about that? But, you know, uh, but uh, uh, the, um, uh, that didn't, those things didn't bother me so much. But it does bother me that, um, that we've come to a point where... I may have been less vulnerable to some of these. I still got the fatso stuff, you know. But, uh, but the less vulnerable is because I tried to communicate to, with people based on what we had in common. And that's the first way that we're ever going to convince anybody to even listen to us, that we build that bridge, that first bridge, and it makes it harder for someone to say, uh, to, to start spitting venom and start destroying, trying to destroy someone personally because they, they see how really you're a little like them. Uh, so when I would discuss things on the campaign trail, I would, I, you know, I'd talk about the PTA or, you know, because, um, uh, because that's a part of my life and it was probably a part of the lives of people with whom I was speaking or I'd you know, talk about my experiences growing up on a military base because that made it maybe a little bit harder. I think that's what we need to do, build those bridges on what we have in common, knowing that we, that we have things we differ on and then we can start dealing with the, the things on the, on the outside um, uh, that, uh, with which we dis, on which we disagree. Uh, I don't despair in the long term, but obviously it's gonna take um, a monumental change in the way we communicate uh, in order to uh, get rid of the ugliness. Um, I'd be, be interested, I wish I could be uh, uh, here and listen to that, uh, the talk on the politics of personal destruction um, and see if there's any hopefulness in that. Uh, I, I certainly um, I hope that there is. I, I feel it a little bit anyway. John ran a reasonably positive campaign uh, when he ran in the primaries and it made it somewhat harder to be to be uh, to try to be personally destructive of him because that was the tenor that he had he had uh, set. So it, it takes a lot of discipline to do that, uh, and um, and maybe if more people adopt it, maybe we can start ridding ourselves of it. I have, however, been looking at the advertisements on television here, and we're not there yet. My name's Eddie. First of all, I want to thank you for sharing the way that you have tonight. Uh, it means so much to so many individuals out there to be able to hear your experiences, compare it to their own, know that there's hope out there, know that there's incredible strength within each of us, and I just want to thank you for bringing that message. Thank um, you, Oh, you're welcome. And I am a little overweight and a little bald, so I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you look good from here, Eddie. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I guess my question is, now that you reflect back um, after the campaign and after your battle with cancer, what maybe what primary thing did you learn about yourself that maybe you didn't know before um, existed inside of you that came forth and that uh, maybe now that you hold on to strong or stronger than you ever knew? Well, honestly, there are a lot of things that uh, that I went through. There were there are parts of your life that you take for granted. Um, in the book, I talk about religion, for example. Um, you take a lot, you just you think, well, I believe this, and then you just sort of move on. You don't have to think about it a lot, uh, with some cognizance of where I am right now. Um, I say, you know, I had a lot of searching to do there, uh, and actually, when I it was when I started thinking about the book, that I started thinking, you know, it's. Uh, I, I knew all along that I, that I didn't have the strength some people said, but I wasn't thinking, all right, so where does it come from? So how do I get through these things? And it, was, it was actually reflection while I had plenty of time to do it that made me realize, okay, this is where it comes from. It comes from the people who hold you up, some of whom you see, some of whom you never see. I mean, I always thank people who did, you know, in the book, I thank the women who came before me uh, who had breast cancer. Uh, who submitted to, I, I was in a clinical study, that was fairly easy to do, uh, uh, but I wasn't in a clinical trial of a new medication. The women who, to, who participated in clinical trials of new medications took chances with their own health in order to make certain that the women who followed them had a better chance of survival. Uh, I owe an enormous debt to those women. I don't know who they are. 
but I owe a debt to them. The only way to repay the debt is to try to help the women who follow me. Uh, so when I was asked to participate in a study, though that did not, I did, wasn't taking a chance with my health, um, uh, except, but that was what was available at the time, I felt obligated to do it. Uh, but it was really thinking about those things, having those experiences and thinking back on them um, that let me know that I thought I had something to say because I, I really had learned something from the process. I'll answer, I'll go back and answer, though you didn't ask it exactly, the things that I learned, but this I really learned from Wade's death, as I thought about a lot about, um, about God in, in our online groups, there were tons of arguments of all kinds, uh, because people came with all different kinds of beliefs, and it was, uh, and they were trying to reconcile them with one another, and reconcile them with the death often of their child. Uh, and also all of us carrying with us this enormous hope of reunion and uh, and that uh, sometimes somebody else's belief might take your chance at reunion away. And so it, it, was, it was a very trying experience to live through in a group about whom I cared deeply. But when I thought about God, I hadn't really thought so much about what kind of God I had. And if, I don't know whether you all remember the show Genesis that Bill Moyers did. It was on PBS. It was a great series, and they, it's available on video and on, and on tape. You can listen to it. Uh, but it, it truly is wonderful. At one point, one of the speakers uh, says um, uh, something about God, and, and someone responds, that can't be God's mod motivation, because that would not be an honorable motivation. And the person who said something in the first place said, we don't get the God we want, we get, we get the God we have. Um, it's certainly true of the Old Testament God, you get the God you have. Um, and I had to think about, all right, what God do I have? Um, our son's automobile accident, uh, he was driving down the road going the speed limit. He had a seatbelt on, he had a car with an airbag. Um, he was driving safely, the wind blew his car off the side of the road. Now. You know, you don't have to know a lot about Job to know the wind as the hand of God might be a pretty good metaphor. Um, and uh, when he tried to get the car back on, he couldn't. And uh, the car, the wheel caught, his car flipped, the boy next to him walked away, and he died. So I have, I have to reconcile my God with those facts. And so I had to accept that I had a God who would not intervene, who would let nature and human conduct take its course, however that turned out, and uh, a God who didn't promise intervention but promised enlightenment and promised salvation, kind of waiting for that enlightenment myself, but, you know, wait, but, but that's what I was promised, and that's all I was promised from my God. So I had, there was a lot of that that you, that you have to think about in, in ways that you never thought you would ever have to think about them before. Um, and it's good because you could come to a place of, of acceptance, you know, and, and peace about it, which um, certainly for a long time I thought I, I would never achieve. To compound the pain that you felt uh, with your health diagnosis, uh, many of us also felt the pain of the results of the election. Yes. <laughs> we had uh, that too, yeah. Yeah. Um, and compounded further were reports that uh, in Ohio there were numerous irregularities in voting and the fact that the sacred institution of democracy may have been compromised in some way. And my recollection is that the reports had that your husband wanted to challenge the results of the election, but that Senator Kerry didn't. Um, is that accurate? Or, and maybe could you give us some sense as to the texture of the conversation that took place um, after the election and the decision not to challenge it? I actually talk about it a little bit in the book. Um, the, the night of the election, uh, John had been on the telephone, often on the speaker phone, and we had a suite. And I could, so even when I went into the next room, I could hear some of the conversations. My brother, my daughter, uh, my sister were there for large portions of the conversations. And the first conversations that John had uh, involved a number of people, uh, all of whom were not optimistic about the results, uh, but were uh, saying that there were a lot of provisional votes in Ohio. They weren't really questioning so much how the votes had, had been, whether they'd been manipulated, other than the, that there were provisional votes out there. Um, in the, uh, uh, in, uh, on that night, first talks about conceding on that night, but 
but it was early yet, and there was still hope, apparently, and so we were there. Uh, it was late, I don't know, it may have been 1.30 or so, when they called John and asked him to go out and make a statement to the crowd that was waiting, and that's when um, uh, John said, uh, we've waited this long, you know, we can wait a little longer. Uh, uh, and the ne by, by, by the next morning when I got up, they were back on the phone again, a number of people, and uh, every voice on the phone, with the exception of John's, was saying that we, could, could, we should concede. And John was saying, we promised people that we would count their votes. And so at that point, we really only, only all we knew really was provisional votes at that point. That was the only issue we really knew about. More things became unfolded in the days to come, but at that point, all we were talking about was provisional votes. And, they, um, and uh, John kept arguing, but you know, the decision was not his to make. It never, and he understood that it was not his decision to make, uh, but the decision was made to concede. And they, so we went to Faneuil Hall later that morning, and, and uh, uh, John spoke, and then John Kerry spoke. Uh, if you look over what John, my husband, said, he never used the word concede, he never used the word defeat. He, uh, he, he just did not feel comfortable saying those words, um, given that we didn't know everything there was to know. Uh, and the decision to move forward, John argued for, and argued with, uh, spoke to lawyers about, about uh, subsequent challenges. But again, it's not his decision to make. I think there was ultimately some involvement of the Kerry Edwards campaign in an, in an Ohio case. Uh, the judge demanded that the campaign be a party if the case was going to go forward. I, I, I have to admit, I, I, I did not. Um, by this point, the Electoral College votes had come in. You know, it wasn't going to be overturned, so the question would be, what the value of, of uh, pursuit was. It, it, for my life, it, 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 I had something else to pay attention to, so I don't know what happened in that case, but I do know that there was a case that at least there was some talk that Carrie Edwards participated in in Ohio about that, but, uh, and John was in favor of, of participating in the challenge, but, uh, but I don't know whether that ever happened either. Neither of these were actually his decision to make, and that's rightfully so. John Kerry had won the nomination. And he'd won it legitimately. He, you know, I mean, and, and decisively. Um, and so these were his decisions, his right to make, uh, and not and not my husband's. Yes, Elizabeth, thank you for your comments about community and the importance of it and reaching out to others. One of the things that I'm interested in hearing from you, who are so involved in the political scene, uh, many of us voters feel very discouraged at this time, uh, facing an election that's upcoming. Um, we feel that corporate America has really taken over the power of our vote, that we've got taxation without any representation. We see a country where a Congress can't move forward and be decisive. Um, what would you say at this point would be our best course, and what's your perspective on corporate America's involvement uh, in our electoral process? Um, we need uh, to have public financing of campaigns. We need to figure out it's a complicated issue. Um, but we, we, that, that, needs, that has to be part of the solution. It's not just that uh, pe people give campaign money, then their opinion gets skewed by the people who handed them the money. You know, uh, the truth is that, that um, politicians will listen to people who hand them the money, and they'll listen to the heads of churches, and they'll listen to the grocer at the corner. Um, uh, they really do listen to just about everybody. I think that most, most politicians, Republican and Democrat, will listen to most anybody who, um, uh, who's a constituent who has something to say. The problem, of course, is not, it's not individual contributions. The problem are, hu are the huge contributions that are made uh, by businesses. The very fact that during the Medicare bill that uh, Congress, uh, Republican congressmen were, um, were threatened by pharma that they would fund their opponents in elections uh, if they didn't vote with the Medicare bill, uh, and they knew they would fund them well, uh, is an indication that we have gone badly askew, and there's really no way to correct it without moving towards uh, towards the public financing of, of campaigns. So um, that's the ultimate answer. There are a lot of quizzes. Not it's, that's not an easy place to get because it's very complicated on who gets funded and when they get funded and those kinds of things. 
um, but that's the ideal. Hi, Elizabeth. Um, my name is Allison, and I'm 17 years old, and I was diagnosed with cancer um, a few months ago. Bless your heart. <laughs> um, and I was wondering how you deal um, with the fear of cancer coming back. Um, and my second question is when lightning strikes, especially for you three times with the loss of your son, cancer, and the loss to the election, um, sometimes it can seem like the world is going 100 miles per hour and you just need to go 25. How do you communicate to your community that you need support? Uh, well, let's see. Um, one thing is if you have cancer, there is no such thing as a yet. Yet. I hope that word means something. Uh, it's not just a throwaway. There's no cure yet, but your, uh, but your chance, and your, so your chances of getting cancer if you've had it are increased of, uh, over people who've never had it. But they're not increased a lot. And we also know, I, you know, I now know that that fatso stuff, people were saying to me that that actually has an effect on my getting cancer, that I needed to be better about my nutrition, better about those things. So it's, you know, maybe I live a healthier life because I know I have this threat hanging over me. Uh, so maybe in the end I'm actually benefited oddly by this experience as opposed to, to um, uh, ravaged by it. Um, and honestly, the other thing I think about that is that it's really important to hold on to hope. And I think that Wade's death, because it was instantaneous, really taught us that. There's nothing in the world we wanted more than just the chance. Just give us, give us 10 minutes, give us whatever we, you could give us to save him, and we didn't have it. But in this fight, and in your fight, you have the chance. And the important thing is not to think that if I hope and I'm, I'm a fighter, then I beat it, because there are a lot of people who do die hopeful and fighting. But here's the thing about it. Until they did, they, were, they didn't stop dying, start dying early. They, they were fighting and living every day until then. And so that's the important thing is that don't think that you just because you have this diagnosis that it's therefore a death sentence and you can start dying now. There's no reason to do that. There's no reason to, to live the rest of your life with this threat over your head in that same way because in the way you mock it is, is, uh, is to live well. Uh, as for the as for the idea of what you um, of of uh, um, thinking that uh, this the question was whether there's so much that happens to you and you, you think there's there's is that, a, is that a sense of hopelessness? I'm I'm, I'm afraid, Allison. I'm, exactly what was the sec, the second part? If you've hit, you've been. I remember what you said that you you've, a triple whammy and. So how you tell your community, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, you're really direct with your community. Um, I tell a story about my sister. Uh, she's a couple years younger than I am. She had a daughter the same age as Wade, and they would come and spend Christmas with us. And she, when she would spend Christmas, uh, one year, Jordan, my niece, was, um, I don't know, maybe eight, a little older than, or nine, a little older than you might think they'd be for Santa Claus, but she still believed in Santa Claus. But she came into the kitchen where my sister and I were, were cooking and said to her mother, you told me you would always tell me the truth. Is there a Santa Claus? To which my sister said, ask your Aunt Beth. <laughs> So immediately on the spot, so this, this is what I told her. I said, I know you made something for your mother. You showed it to me, you're really excited about it. I said, you're gonna wrap it up on Christmas morning and you're gonna give it to, you know, put it under the tree for her. And then when that present is on her lap, I don't care what's on your lap. You'll put opening presents, you don't care about yours. You wanna see how much she likes your present. And that feeling, that great feeling, anticipation might be a word, but it's really not a big enough word for that great way we feel when somebody's about to get a gift from us. Uh, I said, so grown-ups have that same feeling all the time. We know just what our children want. They wrote it down for us, you know? And uh, so when, when they get what they want, we have that same feeling, and we call that feeling Santa Claus. Was, you like, was that good? <laughs> What you have to remember in your life is that when you tell somebody, what I really need right now is somebody to go to the grocery for me. That's not what you need. What I really need right now is somebody to listen to me. I need someone to go get a pedicure with me. I want to forget all about this for a few minutes. You know, whatever it is you really want, you should ask for that. 
Because what you're really doing is, that's, just, that's the Santa Claus feeling. You're letting them give you exactly what you want, and you've actually given them a gift. Because our friends want to help us. When we're grieving, when we're in pain or fighting disease, people want to help us. They often just don't know how. So we have a responsibility too, even though we might be hurting, we have a responsibility to show them how to be the best possible friends to us. So, I mean, just be direct about whatever it is. And, uh, and if people can't do it, they'll say, okay, I can do a little less than that. I can't go to the grocery store right now, but what if I go for you next week or whatever. Uh, people, you know, you, you, you're actually helping them if you, if you tell them exactly what you want. Um, I couldn't have wanted anything better than the warm response that I got here. Thank you all very much. Thank you all so much.